Rabi Ataya is the founder and CEO of Bait.com, the Middle East leading job site, which now serves over 26 million professionals and 40,000 employers from its 12 regional offices. He also co-founded GoNabit, the region's first group purchasing site, Infofort, the Middle East's first and leading records management company, and he serves on the board of several Middle Eastern startups. He also serves on the board of Queen Rania Foundation, which is focused on empowering youth through education in our region. He is a graduate of Stanford University with a BS in Electrical Engineering and an MS in Engineering Economic Systems. Welcome to the, uh, the inaugural Baith Mad Talks uh, Thought Leadership Series. Going back to your childhood, is there a moment that you can think of that inspired you, uh, a moment that defined you? I was very lucky to be inspired throughout my childhood. So I had a, I grew up in Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait was a very comfortable, safe, uh, easy place to grow up. And I grew up, uh, my parents are of Palestinian origin. And that was always a very inspirational community because here was a community of people who, who were refugees, who had come into this uh, country pretty much at its founding and were part of the social fabric and helped build it. And all of them had just the most amazing stories. Uh, people who had, uh, had to leave their homes at age eight, nine, 10, and then go off in the world without really anything uh, to their name. And were able in many cases to build wonderful businesses, educational institutions, uh, and, and generally the community was great at giving back. So every day, uh, was was a day of inspiration and there are countless stories I can share with you of just amazing people who who really beat the odds uh, and and built wonderful things for themselves and their families and I feel that sometimes we are a little bit spoiled uh, because we have so much around us and when we immerse ourselves in our in our parents and our grandparents story um, that is when the real inspiration comes through what did your grandfather go through when he was a refugee, he had a family, and yeah. you know, how did he move forward from there? So they went from uh, essentially having a lot uh, to having nothing, to everyone being cooped up as refugees in, uh, in a single room and with no jobs, no sources of income, all of their assets were left behind. And what I give, uh, what I realize is just amazingly uh, wonderful about that generation is by all accounts he just got on with it so I, I can imagine it's so easy to become depressed to give up uh, to really question the meaning of life in situations like that um, but he was a man built of stronger stuff and I think realized that he had a family to take care of they were a large family and he had to get on with his life and so as a landowner he started looking around for uh, pieces of land that he could caretake on behalf of others, found Lebanese landowners who he essentially was able to strike deals with, where he essentially would uh, grow the crops on the land, would sell it, and then would give them uh, a share of the returns. And that allowed him to at least provide for, uh, for my father and, uh, and his siblings. Uh, my grandfather was able to provide for the family, and my father was able to focus on his education very quickly and really outperform there as a passport uh, to improving his life. So the core secret source of that point in time for your grandfather particularly and to some extent uh, even your father was to be very resourceful um, because they didn't have anything else. Yes. All they had was that inner, inner drive and that, that desire to, be, to create something sure. and then they were resourceful. I think is is that something that you've inherited? Resourcefulness together with grit. Um, yeah. Grit is the willingness to stand up as you're getting knocked down. And I think my grandfather had a tremendous amount of grit. Um, and I think that's something that over the years I realize more and more uh, is just an, a very important part of anyone's success, whether it's uh, his, mine, or anyone I work with. Um, if you give up your battle plans at the first uh, obstacle, uh, you, you know, you're going to have challenges. Things, tough things are going to come everyone's way. And then the question is, how do you hold up to them? So both your grandfather and your father uh, basically were entrepreneurial because, as you've mentioned, uh, 
a village in South Lebanon um, is full of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, the fa- there are farmers, there are craftsmen, uh, there fishermen, are whatever fishermen, they are, you whatever. generally work for yourself. Absolutely. So yeah. there's no God-given right to get a job. Yeah. And uh, so, and today's generation is looking for jobs. Sure. And you have created the number one job site. Yeah. So do you think that jobs is an inherent human right and, and that governments need to deliver jobs to sure. you? No, that's a great question. I, we all need to find ways where we can create value. I think for us, even those who choose to not be the number one person in organization, within any organization, what's expected of any person at a job today is to be entrepreneurial in mindset. There are very few jobs today that are about just do this task. Uh, Today's jobs tend to be a lot more about, in a fast-changing world, is here's a task that we know we need to get done, but there are probably a hundred ways that it should change and evolve, and can you help us change and evolve this? And if you don't exhibit that entrepreneurial spirit within your job, you probably won't hold that job for very long in today's world. Um, So I think more and more every job is entrepreneurial. And I think just like we went from a world of primarily small businesses and high entrepreneurship to a very corporate, structured world of large businesses, I almost see the pendulum swinging back and more and more people all around the world are becoming contractors, freelancers, or when they do take on a full-time job, they really have a contractor freelancer mindset about it. So now we're in our mid-1990s, you just graduated, you're out there with, you know, with a fancy degree in your hands. Did you, did you actually apply for jobs? Yeah, so you know, this was always just an amazing thing. So I got a fancy degree, I got relatively good grades, I got good grades, I mean, I, I worked hard also. You made your parents proud. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's funny about that because I don't, my Stanford wouldn't send uh, grades to parents. And, and so the first time my dad actually saw my grades was about three years ago as I was rifling through some old papers. Okay. And he, you know, I picked up my transcript and I said, here, dad, take a look. And he's like, wow, you did pretty well. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, after all these years, he finally knew what his dollars were spent on. Um, so, yes, one of the great things, advantages of the university we were at was there was a lot of college recruiting. A lot of the top companies would come uh, to recruit. And so I had no problems getting my first interviews. And long story short, I, within a couple of days, had six almost back-to-back interviews, and within two weeks of that, got rejection letters from each of them. And this well, was a well done. Yeah, <laughs> this was a massive shock to me. And again, when you talk about humbling experiences, because I thought, hey, I've got great grades, um, I've gone to a great university. I had never really been rejected at anything before. So even my application to universities, I got in. So what am I missing here? What's wrong? Is that what galvanized you into entrepreneurship? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still believe I'm unemployable, but no, that wasn't what, the, at that stage it was just, I realized I'm missing something. And so ra- raced off to the library to try and learn more and discovered very quickly that interviewing was a game. There were certain rules to that game. And if you followed those rules, you were much more likely to find a job. And so I read up a couple of books and then was fortunate enough to get a whole bunch of additional interviews. And now I got an offer every single time. And so here I was, the exact same person with just a few different skills, and it made all the difference. And so that's something I always recount to new graduates who are looking for jobs, is that knowing what you know isn't sufficient. Your educational background isn't sufficient. There are skills related to how to look for a job, how to apply for a job, and how to interview that are almost as important as, as your educational background in, in helping you get a job. It's, it's far more difficult to find your passion than it is to avoid the things you dislike. And in avoiding the things you dislike, you find your passions. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my journey is about waking up and discovering I really don't like this in my life right now. And then steering as clear away from it as is humanly possible. So investment banking to me was the counter of the asocialness of 
uh, electrical engineering. In electrical engineering, I was behind a computer the whole yeah. time. And in investment banking, I was in front of people. And so I, I strove to something where I'd be a lot more. You have been a pioneer. Obviously, this was technology, but you have been a pioneer uh, when it comes to the, the internet uh, rollout in this part of the world. Um, what made you excited about the internet and the platform that was available? Because at that time, it was very, very embryonic. What excited you? Sure. 2000 was the start, really, of the internet in the region. And I realized that there was a real opportunity to leverage the power of the internet to impact the broader community. And that was something I was very excited about. Was it too early? Would you do it <laughs> if you know what you know now? If you knew it then, yeah, would you so still do it? <laughs> in the region, the single most pressing issue was we had an exploding youth population. And across the region, that young population was complaining about their inability to find jobs. And that was made more difficult because we have the highest proportion of migrant labor in the world, but we didn't have information flowing freely. Similarly, employers, even though there was all of these young people looking for jobs, employers kept on complaining about their inability to find the right talent. And we realized by creating an online marketplace, we can bring both sides together and opportunity and talent could mix and match much more easily. Now, was it too early? Everything in the world is a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. There's nothing that's entirely good or entirely bad. The challenges of starting back then, a whole bunch of them, one, less than 1% of the population was online. So that was really a challenging time to start an online business. Two, we started in, we got together as a team in June of 2000. The dot-com bubble had just burst globally, and dot-coms became known as dot-bombs. So there were dot-bombs globally, and in the Middle East there wasn't an internet to speak of, and so that made us even more uh, like a fish out of water. Can you share the, uh, the mission of uh, Bait? Yeah, so our, our vision, which precedes our mission, is the what got us together as a founding team was we wanted to build a Middle Eastern, we termed it institution. And by institution, we meant a company that was separate from us as individuals. Because having grown up in the region, everything seems to be named, you know, like Ataya and Co. or, you know, Ataya and Brothers, etc. I wanted something that was really had a life of its own, as, as a lot of great corporate institutions are have. Um, we wanted to build a Middle Eastern institution that was globally recognized, admired, and respected. And so the Middle Eastern wasn't that we'd only want to serve this region, but we wanted people to understand that we came from this region uh, and that we truly built something that was reflective of what we could be proud of in the region. So that was the, the vision. The mission is how do we get to building such a great company? And that was about empowering people with tools and information to build their lifestyle of choice. And that, what that means in very simple terms is we realize the people we admire and respect are the people who've helped us lead better lives. And so we wanted to build a company that helped people lead better lives. And the first problem that we could help solve was perhaps the most important problem that we felt was existed in the region, which was this problem of high youth unemployment that was growing very quickly. Which is there today, I mean. Uh... Which remains a massive issue and the reason for the Arab Spring and a whole bunch of other things, or one of the key reasons for the Arab Spring. Just to put a few metrics in, uh, on the table, you have about 40,000 corporations that are linked to Bait. You have uh, apparently um, 25 million um, unique users that come in and connect with you. Um, that's taken a long time to build. Sure. Um, that channel to market that you have created, how do you utilize them now with mobile available, uh, apps available, new products coming on board, uh, social media coming on board? So the dynamics must have changed completely from when you started 15 years ago. What do you feel now? What is going on in your life? The, the, the change is tremendous and you're absolutely right. And that's what's exciting to a large degree why... I get excited every morning to wake up and come to the offices because so much more can be done every day. The very fact that we are a technolo technology platform yeah. 
means we can leverage what's newest and greatest to really serve greater numbers of people. People And mindsets, you're absolutely right, change. So I'll give you one clear example. When we started BAIT, we surveyed uh, the people who got on uh, the site, and their biggest concern was privacy. And the reason was, back then, if you were found to be looking for a job, not only could your employer terminate you, but they could probably deport you and prevent you from coming back. I mean, if you remember these days, it was Absolutely. challenging. You were really beholden to a particular employer. And so we built a tremendous amount of features to allow for different forms of confidentiality. You know, hide yourself from your current employer or have your CV public, uh, searchable to employers, but hide your name and your contact details. Or So there were different themes. Um, what then happened is social media changed people's mindsets. Increasingly, people were much more open about every facet of their life, not just their job seeking, but lots of other far more uh, intimate things. And I would say that's almost something that we missed. For the longest time, we maintained this absolute care for the privacy and confidentiality of our users. And then at some point, we just very apologetically almost put a little checkbox on the site and we said, would you be interested in perhaps making your profile public? And public meant it's Google indexable and other people could find you other than subscribed employers. And while we were very apologetic about it, just to give you uh, a case, over 60% of our database now has said we are public. So you know, what we were really concerned about was no longer a concern for our user base. Two years ago, we had no mobile users on Bay. Today, over 60% of my traffic is mobile. And that obviously represents a whole bunch of opportunities and challenges that we're excited. Let's change gears and, and get into the more aggressive area of entrepreneurship and startups and VCs and, and this whole community that we have here. Uh, as we were discussing, 100 million people need jobs in this region. You're a number one job site. So you're serving them in one way. But by your own admission, the, the solution is actually entrepreneurship and starting your own businesses. Why aren't you in that business? Yeah. Or are you in that business? I fundamentally believe that if we're going to dig ourselves out of the mess that we're in in the region, it's very important that we make it far easier for entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs. And that, that doesn't mean... Um, by far easier, there are always obstacles to entrepreneurship, but the obstacles in the region should not be so much higher than they are anywhere else in the world. Uh, we should at least have a competitive playing field in terms of letting people who want to start their businesses start their businesses. So one thing is just talking about it all the time to anyone who listened to me. Bait has over the years been the, uh, the foundation, I think, of many other successful stories that have actually sprung uh, out of it. So um, we, at some point, launched a group buying site out of Bait called uh, GoNabbit, which became one of the first uh, e-commerce exits in the region. Um, uh, at Bait, Mom's World was incubated for a year, and now Mom's World is, a, is viewed as a successful e-commerce business that's growing very rapidly and has gotten quite a bit of uh, investor interest. Um, I myself have invested in well over a dozen uh, different internet businesses uh, across the region. We currently incubate uh, a few other internet businesses that aren't bait. Um, and so I'm in this world, I enjoy this world, I enjoy the world of encouraging uh, uh, people to experiment with new ideas and, and to grow them. Do you think uh, the people have the, the, the same uh, energy and drive. I mean, they may have a great idea, but do they actually have the resilience and the tenacity to execute and to take it all the way through? Because I see so many good ideas, but I just don't see resilience. Yeah. Uh, do you share that? or I see a lot of young people, you're right, coming up with some great ideas, but oftentimes they're not necessarily prepared to build a business. They might be prepared to build a product building a business is a bit different than building a product. And I think that's something that people can learn. And, uh, and whether they learn it on the job or whether they learn it uh, going to an MBA somewhere, but it's something they can learn. And I, I dare say you are uh, either directly or just by 
your influence, mentoring a lot of people and inspiring a lot of people around you. And that becomes a big responsibility. How do you take that responsibility on yourself? I think what I find has been valuable for me when people do seek my advice is to try to never share advice, but to try to share personal experiences that relate so people can take their own conclusions. Because no two situations are exactly the same. And so when someone says, hey, I'm having a challenging time raising money, as opposed to saying this is what you should do, uh, similar to your talk just now about what it took you to find a job, it's far more inspirational for you to say, listen, I knocked on 300 doors before I got one to open for me, than it is to say, go knock on 300 doors. This, so advice comes cheaply. People I found that interact tend to, with, tend to value personal experience sharing much, much more. And the nice thing about sharing your personal experience is you're not making a judgment on someone else's situation. Uh, you're just explaining your interpretation of it and how in your life it's affected you. Uh, any advice that you'd like to give, like to share with a young person who's one looking for a job? What advice would you give to them that they can take on tomorrow morning yeah, so and this, do it now? <laughs> this goes back to the not giving advice things. But, <laughs> but again, and I'll, and I'll stay true and I'll talk about my uh, my my personal experience with this. One, one thing that helped me was taking personal responsibility. I could have easily blamed my lack of getting a job on them, but I had to, it was my life and I was responsible for it. And so ultimately it doesn't help anyone to blame someone else. I think every young person ha has to wake up every day and think how am I gonna take responsibility for my life and make it better. Two is, is it is the law of numbers and you're absolutely right so i had to apply to a dozen jobs you know half a dozen jobs and get rejected and read a whole bunch of books before i started getting accepted we've spoken about this side of the uh, equation the other side of the equation are the employers yeah. what sort of insights do you have uh, in terms of what sh should they be looking for what are the different kinds of skills and uh, and the softer skills that are coming in um, that need to start they need to start engaging with rather than looking at a boring CV. It's a brilliant question. I think employers, one, are realizing increasingly that it's not the hard skills that they need, but it is the soft skills. And in survey after survey, when employers, when we survey these employers, what they primarily complain about is they're not able to find the soft professional skills that's required for success. I attribute that primarily to the fact that People in the Middle East, while they go to great universities and get the hard skills necessary, they're generally getting their first work experience at age 22 onwards after they've graduated from university. So they really have no idea what it's like to actually be in a workplace and they're entirely unprepared for it. And so employers can play a, a great role in encouraging people to get into the workplace early by offering internships and summer jobs in order to bring in younger people early on and get to know them. And that's highly beneficial not just for the job seekers, but it's highly beneficial for the employers. And I'll give you one example. There was a, a university that set up here uh, relatively recently with an MBA program based out of India, SPJN. But their mindset was highly entrepreneurial. So they came into this market thinking, we really want to make a dent. And one of the first things they did was they did corporate outreach. They'd call up employers and they'd say, listen, we've got great students. Take them on. Don't pay them anything. But as part of the program, we want you to give them work opportunities. So we figured, what do we lose? They're providing us CVs. They're providing us great people. It's free labor. Let's take them on. Uh, the first batch, I think we took on six people. We tried them for three months. We hired all six of them. And, and so the fact that we got to know them, they got to know our culture, we learned about each other with a very low risk proposition, helped us build a relationship, which then developed into a great hire for us and a great job for them. So it's a privilege to talk about your family, about your grandfather from the year 1948 uh, to yourself as a grandfather in 2048. 
uh, and the, the, the journey of your life, of your children, of your company and all the contributions that you're making um, is a real privilege. Thank and, you. The privilege and, has been mine, Parak. And, and it's, I appreciate it's, it. it's an amazing journey that we have actually embarked on together, um, which is to inspire young people, uh, to motivate employers and to go out there and provide little insights and nuggets to people so they can take action tomorrow and they can change their lives and they change the lives of people around them. Thank you very much indeed for, it's a real privilege and happy to be working really together with you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you.